before I, I begin, so just a bit of a background about short story. It was brought by the Americans to the Philippines of the early 20th century to teach us English. So it's a colonial tool. So when the Americans came to the Philippines in the early part of the 20th century, they brought more teachers than soldiers because from the mouths of a, of a famous Filipino historian, the most effective means of subjugating a people is to capture their minds. But we were able to, you know, um, acquire and own the form of a short story. So, um, and then the, the English as a language. So we have our own brand of Filipino language. I'm saying this because this is the first time, thank you very much, 87 Press, this is the first time in the history, literary history of our country that uh, a work or, or a book of short stories in Filipino as actually translated into the English language outside the Philippines. And yeah, and here, and not in America, but here in the UK. It's weird, but yes. <laughs> so um, so thank you very much, 87 Press. And um, I'm going to read, um, uh, I'm going to read the translation of another Filipino author, Christine Ong Muslim. She's a very popular poet and short story writer in the Philippines. So she translated the entire book um, that we published in 2017. So I will read the last story uh, from this collection. So the original title is Manga. It's a three-letter word. It's an article in the Filipino language. Um, if It's called Manga, two syllables but three letters. So if this word comes before a noun, the noun or a pronoun will become plural. Okay, so Christine Ong Muslim, the title of the story is Manga, and uh, Christine Ong Muslim uh, translated it as plural. Okay, just a bit of about the structure of this story. So the story is also one way for me to introduce to you our capital city, Manila, because this book is really about Manila, uh, dying and now dead city. So the story is um, um, the, the story is actually moving from point A. It's a city in south in north in south northern part of Manila called Quezon City, in Luzon Avenue, and in the story the focalizer travels to point B, which is called Green Belt. It's somewhere in the south of the Philippines, the financial district. So the entire story is actually moving from point A, a place in Quezon City, moving towards. Point B, a place in southern Manila, and then it will go back to um, uh, point A. So, and Manila is like London, is bisected by a river called Pasig River. So, the entire story, so I'm telling this so that you can follow. So, uh, the focalizer is moving, the story is basically moving entire. Okay, so we will start in the middle. I will read in the middle. When the main character, sorry, I will reveal it to everyone. Uh, the main character died. Uh, one of the, the first character dies uh, because he was crushed by a rampaging elephant in the middle of a, a man, Edsa, the main thoroughfare of Manila. So there is an elephant and then crush the character. And then there is a train passing by on top and then the people are looking on the window and then they witness the death and then one of the passenger saw it and then the story will start from that passenger so i will read the name of the character is yvonne and we will follow yvonne from the north of manila to south and then let's go there so manga terror Curse through Yvonne's body. She imagined how it was to be crushed by that kind of weight, tons of it. The train reached Cabao Station and a throng of commuters boarded the train. Yvonne was still in her seat. She wore white throughout, from her long sleeved top and pants to her leather shoes. Even her hair was white. The only touches of color in her were her red lips and black sunglasses. Today was the day she would catch Alex in a restaurant they frequented in Greenbelt in Makati. Her boyfriend was not going away or anything, but she needed to get to him on time or else they end up breaking up. Her time was almost out. She was not literally dying. If what would happen to her in the next three days was considered death, 
Half of her body was actually as good as dead. She was quietly gazing outside. People secretly glanced at her hair because it was already as white as her clothes. I need to catch him before it's over, she mumbled to herself. She tightly clutched at the train railing. This is my last chance. It was three days ago when Yvonne woke up after a long night being visited by a dream. Like a memory, it was a recurring dream. A recurring dream of six months and she had it almost every night. In her dream, there was a mountain blanketed by a snow, white like her hair. She was staring at the mountain, and the mountain was staring back at her smallness. The mountain was muscular and looked as if it had been sculpted, like a man who would repay your love with security, fierce vigilance, and faithfulness to your body. That same morning, she woke up wet between her thighs. She got up, faced the mirror, and saw the changes in her face and her eyes. Her pupils were gone. Only the whites of her eyes were left. Fear was not her first emotion. She felt nothing, only curiosity. She did not go blind and could still see things clearly. Fears coursed through her cheek. Since then, she wore sunglasses when leaving her apartment. It was noon of the same day when her face turned white, white down her neck to her breasts. Even her nipples had turned white. Her lips, though, remained untouched by the whitening progression. The next day saw all her hair on her body turn white, her eyelashes, armpit hair, and between her ties. Her shoulder-length curly hair looked like uncooked sotangon noodles placed on her head. Why is this happening to me? Yvonne did not know who else to ask about the changing of her body. For two days, she skipped the classes at the university. She very much wanted to call her mother a domestic helper in Hong Kong, but could not bring herself to unload on her and give her more worries. She had no friends at the university. Alex was the only person she could talk to, but he was in the office and didn't want to take her calls at work since her co-workers didn't know about their relationship. Alex's wife used to be his co-worker. Plus, Alex didn't want to be interrupted when at work. Alex? Why are you calling? I told you I'll text you first before you can call. I am busy. I know. I won't, I won't take very long. I need to talk to you. This is important. Important? Something's happening to me. Again? No, no, no. This is not about me wanting us for a cool off. So what is it this time? I don't want another of those freaky stories about Mount Everest in your recurring dream. She did not know what to say next. Why are you crying, Yvonne? Something is happening to my body. Let's meet up, please. Tomorrow morning, same place. Shit, are you pregnant? No. Okay, is this cancer? No. Are you okay, Yvonne? Tomorrow, 9 a.m. at Cafe Breton. That night, she dreamed about the mountain again. She was staring at the mountain and trying to make out its peak. Chilly and dense air blew against her face. In the dream, her hair was still black and her skin brown. From a distance, a man walked towards her. He drew nearer and nearer. She couldn't wait and rushed to meet him. Lustful desire goaded her to see the approaching man. How have you been, Yvonne? You know me? Of course. There were many of us at the mountaintop, all looking at you. We've been waving to you for a long time to get you to climb, but it seems you can't see us. There are still people in the mountain? There's a lot of us out there. We keep waving to you to climb, but you keep standing there, here. Sorry, I can't see you. The snow has covered everything. The man turned to look at the mountain and grinned. Not true. I can see them from here, there. See how the mountain is filled with people? Yvonne saw nothing of the sort. This made her sad and she had to turn her back on the man. She cried and cried until she felt his embrace. As soon as she woke up on the third day, she got dressed quickly to see Alex. That was also when she realized her time was running out. In the bathroom, she, not she noticed a hole in her white breast. The hole was as big as a basketball and went all the way to her neck. Her body was intact, though, because she could still feel the and touch the skin over the hole. It was just that she was slowly disappearing. It made her giggle to see the other, the other breasts in the mirror. 
only half of it left left breast had dis- only half of the, her left breast had disappeared i need to move fast before i become completely invisible i want alex to see me before i get eaten away by invisibility at least someone can attest that i once lived and continue to live even others can see me she got off ayala station and brisk walk along the malls to cafe breton in greenbelt In her haste, she failed to notice that her clothes were slowly falling off. She was passing in front of a beautiful fountain outside Capri Breton when she realized it was already too late. She had totally disappeared. Although she could still hear her breathing, touch herself and see everything around her. She sat at the side of the fountain in the middle of the lavishly appointed place and she watched Alex, how he waited for her. This was the first time that he had to wait for her. Whenever they hadn't meet ups, it was always her, her who did all the waiting. Alex was not a patient man. He left five minutes after nine. Yvonne did not, didn't know that she was not actually thoroughly invisible. Some people had in them to see her. From his seat, Edgar could see her. Edgar. Lipoy's son was on his way home after working the night shift at a bar at the third floor of Greenbelt. He could see Yvonne's stark naked form. Edgar stopped walking and could not believe his eyes. He thought that his lack of sleep and exhaustion were making him hallucinate this scene. No, a naked woman sat at the side of the fountain. The fact that no one else reacted to the naked woman baffled Edgar. Even the security guard at the doorway of the Cafe Burton was unbothered. The thought of having seen a ghost filled him with dread. But he ultimately decided to go down to the floor area where the naked woman sat next to the fountain. Yvonne, who left as Edgar was finding his way down to the mall's lower level, was no longer at the fountain area when Edgar got there. Yvonne went to the chapel to pray because of what she had been meaning to do next to go to the top of the tallest building in Makati to kill herself. She figured no street sweepers would have to deal with the bloody mess that she would make. No pedestrians would be hassled by her splattered body parts on the asphalt. No cops and reporters would need to bother with her death. With the certainty that everything would remain ordinary, including the daily rush hour in the streets of her city, she decided to kill herself. I was sure I saw a naked woman at the fountain. Edgar whispered to himself as he rode a bus home. He was still wrapped in up in disbelief, but no way the people around wouldn't react to a naked woman in their midst. The security guards wouldn't allow it either. He had so many questions. These past few days alone had brought him many unexplainable happenings whose meaning he could not decode. It had been two days since he kept seeing his father, a headless figure whenever the latter used the mirror to check himself. The father is the one who died with elephant. And in the Philippines, in our belief, if you see someone without a head, it's a premonition that the person will actually die. Um, so you tell the person to burn all the clothes and sprinkle it with salt. So he's seeing it now. So, and Lipoy didn't appear to be bothered by this as he continued to comb his hair. Edgar wanted to approach his father about it, but was constantly dissuaded by his belief that if he mentioned it to Lipoy, the premonition might come true. Truth remained a vicious thing, though Edgar believed he always had a choice whether to allow it to stay or live in his world. The bus Edgar was on us was stuck on an Edsa Ayala route. He could not get the strange side of the fountain of his mi- out of his mind. Who was that naked woman? Was she real or just ha- my hallucination? Putang ina. He rested his head against a glass window and looked outside the bus. He never rode a train to get home from work. It was always the bus since he started working in Makati. He could see, he could, he could rest during the bus ride and could reflect on the things he hadn't given much attention to and see the world as if viewing the entirety of, of a parade from a stationary location. It was also during a bus ride that he had a chance to talk to himself. His mother said he was different compared to his siblings, though he did not ask what he, she meant by different. 
as far as Edgar was concerned, his relationship with his parents wasn't that deep. He couldn't remember a time when he was able to confide about what angered him or made him feel any strong emotion to his mother. Once he heard them talk about him, your son is always lost in his thoughts. I don't know what's with you, Lita. Stop with that nonsense. He's, not, he's just not that outgoing type. That doesn't mean he always lost in his thoughts. Sometimes I really can't understand your son. Sometimes he scares me. Or what he is going to say that may be, I might not understand or he'll say something that's hard for me to accept. What? I don't know, Lita. You're not making sense. I'm telling you, your son scares me. Since then, Edgar distanced himself from his mother. He could not understand why he hadn't felt uncomfortable around his mother. There were times their interactions became awkward, as if they were two strangers who didn't know each other. So that's what happens when you discover someone is scared of you. A gap between you is formed. That's how he rationalized to himself what was happening. The bus stopped at SM Mega Mall. Edgar looked at the giant billboards attached to the mall's tall, wide building. Beautiful creatures, beautiful sight, he would tell himself at the sight of the fashion models on the billboard. But what is beauty? A man next to him asked. The man was older, wearing a nicely tailored polo and holding a briefcase. Edgar was speechless, but it seemed the man could read his questioning eyes. You said, beautiful creatures, beautiful sight, at the pictures at Mega Mall. Now I'm asking you, what is beauty? That frightened Edgar. Wait, I didn't say such a thing. You did not say it, but you were thinking it. Can you read my mind? Edgar wanted to stand up and sit elsewhere at the, as the encounter was quickly creeping him out. How could this man possi possibly know what he was thinking? Don't worry, Edgar. I am not an evil person. I am just a poet. If you're not evil, then how come how come I can't hide anything from you? You really can't hide anything from me. And because of that, I can possibly be evil. If I were evil, then there would be things about you that I would not know. For example, your mother, father, your siblings, even your wife. Edgar bowed his head, his nervousness causing him to sweat. You're the one who's evil, Edgar. You assign motives to people because of how they see you. You never open yourself up to them in the first place. This morning, you caught a glimpse of something in this world, in your place of work, right? Caught a glimpse? I have no idea what you're saying. Never mind. You saw life's nakedness. Someone showed herself to you. That's courage. Edgar quickly thought of the woman next to the fountain at Greenbelt. That's right. It was her. It was her. The man, the man got up and told the conductor he was getting off the bus. Edgar was left with so many questions. The man did not even look back to spare him one last glimpse. Edgar sank further into his seat, watching the people outside the bus waiting for all sorts of things, the houses and buildings along the side of the road. Every day he passed by that route, and every day the city changed its appearance. His right hand felt numb. He could not move it. This usually happened whenever he was emotionally strained by anything from anger and fear to unrequited love. How was it possible that someone could read these thoughts? How could he hide himself from this world now if a stranger could just easily see into his deepest parts of being? He was in a mental haze from the time he got off the bus for his entire walk home. Another tiring work, Edgar? Lita greeted him as he entered the house. He paused and looked at his mother. They eyed each other for a long time. Edgar bowed his head and retired to his room. Lita was left standing, confused. Then she broke down and cried. She could no longer recognize the person she had given birth to. She mop her muffled sobbing become a mournful wail. From his bed, Edgar could still hear his mother. He closed his eyes and thought about how, later, when his father, Lee Poi, got home, he would tell his parents that he wanted to die. He wanted to end hoping for an opportunity that would never come. What Edgar did not know was that, 
in the city where he was placed, decision-making was in the hands of the faith. Thank you. That's Manila.